Have you ever gazed at the night sky full of stars, points of light, and wondered what they are, what they'd be like if you could see them up close? We even have a nursery rhyme about that. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Most of those points of light are stars and they stay in fixed places in the sky. They're just balls of burning hydrogen gas. But some of them actually move. They wander. They're wandering stars. We call those planets. And they are close enough for us to explore. When I was a young girl, I had this poster up in the, my bedroom next to my bed. And I'd look at it every night before I go to sleep. And I'd dream of what it would be like to explore another world and find out what its surface is like, what it would be like to, to really be there. At the time, the Apollo astronauts were walking on the moon. They were exploring, and I naturally aspired to be one of them and to find out what it would be like to walk on the moon, leave footprints there in places that no one had ever gone before. 85 years ago, an astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh was searching for those wandering stars beyond the orbit of Neptune, so far from the sun where nothing had been discovered yet before. And he actually did find a star that moved in January of 1930, a star that was in one place one night and six nights later was in a different place. And he found Pluto. He discovered one of these wandering stars. For the past 50 years, we've been exploring the planets of our solar system. And in 1991, the US Postal Service put out a, a series of stamps honoring all the spacecraft, or the first spacecraft, to explore each one of the planets in our solar system. So we've been turning those points of light into worlds we can explore by sending these robots to them to find out what they look like up close. Yet, Pluto remained unexplored. We hadn't sent anything out that far, ever. So a team was assembled in the early 1980s to plan this mission and send something and finally find out what this tiny point of light looked like. The best picture we had with the Hubble Space Telescope was really just a smudge of light, not showing much detail on the surface at all. We did find out a little bit more detail um, with using the Hubble Space Telescope. Pluto actually does have a very varied surface with different colors in different places, lots of um, different patches on it. So we're able to map out what Pluto looks like around its, it, its surface. It actually rotates once every 6.3 days. So we get different views as we look at a day on Pluto. So the team that uh, was putting the mission together knew what Pluto looked like on various faces. So one of the sides of Pluto had a bright spot on it. And this is what really attracted them. Sending a spacecraft to Pluto would be a flyby mission. You could just fly by, and that was going to be it. And since it takes 6.3 days for Pluto to rotate once, we're not going to get close-up views of the whole thing just one side. So this was the side that was chosen, where this big bright spot was. This is a picture of the New Horizons spacecraft as it was being assembled. And just like Pluto, very, very small, only 1,500 miles across, very, very far from the sun, a year on Pluto takes 248 Earth years. So it takes that long for Pluto to go around the sun once. So just like Pluto, tiny and small, the spacecraft also had to be small to go that fast, that far. It's about the size of a grand piano, and there are some people in this picture for scale to give you an idea how big it is. And it's equipped with cameras and spectrometers and scientific instruments to learn everything we possibly could about this world that was still just a point of light. We had no idea what it was going to look like. Finally, on January 19th, 2006,
the spacecraft was launched and sent on its journey to Pluto, faster and farther than any spacecraft had been sent from the Earth. Moving at 30,000 miles per hour, it passed the moon in just nine hours and was on its way to Pluto. But still, it took nine and a half years to get there. The destination day was July 14th, 2015, when, Pl when New Horizons finally reached Pluto. Now, going that fast, as, the, as July 14th drew closer and closer, we all wished somehow we could slow it down. <laughs> it had taken that long to get that far. But it was going to keep going by Pluto just as fast, so things had to happen very quickly. And our view of Pluto got gradually bigger in the months leading up to July. You can see those smudges are becoming a little clearer and clearer still. And just to remind you, this was the best picture we'd had before New Horizons arrived. And once it sent back its first picture, Pluto was instantly transformed into a world we can explore, showing us detail on the surface that we never imagined would be there. Incredible detail, and it even had a heart to greet us. <laughs> That heart region has been designated Tomba Regio in honor of Clyde Tomba, the discoverer of Pluto. I need to mention, though, that that is an informal designation. <laughs> Tomba Regio up close is a very bright, smooth area and has interesting um, portions on it that are made of nitrogen ice, carbon dioxide ice, things that here on Earth closer to the sun would normally be gases are solid on Pluto and form Pluto's surface and, and coat Pluto's surface. There are mountains on Pluto in the areas around Tombo Regio. Blocks of ice have been, it looks like, broken up. The surface of Pluto is going to be constructed mainly of water ice. Water ice out at Pluto acts like rock here on Earth. There are mountains on Pluto that are as high as the Rocky Mountains yet they're not made of granite out in Pluto. It's water ice, really. Some more details of the surface around Tomba Regio shows some impact craters, those circular features, but they don't look alike. They're different sizes, different colors on the inside, and even some of the areas in the dark part in the center show dune-like features, which is quite interesting because we know here on Earth that dunes require wind. And the winds on Pluto, while there may be some, they're really most likely not, not strong enough to, to create dunes. Pluto has an amazing array of colors on its surface. Again, a testimony to the different varieties of ices on that coat, um, that water ice layer. And even closer up still shows a great variety of colors and um, textures as well. But, 15 minutes after the Pluto flyby, the cameras were turned back towards the sun and looked at almost a completely backlit Pluto. This is Pluto at sunset, really. You're seeing nearly the full globe of, of the body and incredible layered hazes in the sky. This is Pluto's atmosphere. It has an atmosphere. So zooming in even further, shows a gorgeous view of those mountains on the horizon that, again, are as high as the Rocky Mountains that we have. The smooth areas of Tomba Regio are visible on the right. Those are nitrogen glaciers where that ice is moving on the surface of Pluto. This is not a, a, a surface that has remained static and the same for years and years. It has changed. We know that because there aren't any impact craters. We don't see impact craters on, on Tomba Regio anywhere. So finally, we are able to say <laughs> and revise that old um, postage stamp that Pluto has been explored. We've taken on that question of what if and pursued our natural desire to explore our surroundings, to find out what our solar system is like, what lies out there, and New Horizons accomplished that. 
What will we find when we set sail for the stars and send our spacecraft even further beyond? Thank you.